Chaumin eCash, as the name says, was invented by a genius cryptographer called David Chaum. And this was 1982, so this is a precursor to Bitcoin by a long stretch and any kind of payments on the internet and online payments. So David Chaum came up with this idea to build a anonymous payment system back in 82 that allows users who have a bank account, for example, to execute anonymous payments on that bank account because he foresaw already in 82 that most of our lives will be online at some point and we will be leaving traces for everything that we do and he anticipated that already in 82 which is amazing to think about because the internet was still very far away for consumers and so in 82 he comes up with this idea called blind signatures and figures that you can actually make a payment protocol out of this idea and so for anyone who doesn't know what a blind signature is the typical example that folks like to give in order to imagine what it's about is a physical one one with the carbon paper and we'll do it here again so imagine so the idea of blind signatures is that someone can give you a signature on a that they haven't seen yet but once you present them the document with the signature they can verify the signature was indeed from them so in a physical world an example might be a contract that you write for example that contract may say this contract is worth one bitcoin and you put that paper contract into a, a carbon paper envelope a carbon paper is where you you know you write on top of it and presses through to the, to the document below. So when you put this original contract, the contract says this is worth one Bitcoin into a carbon paper envelope and now send it, for example, to a bank, the bank might say, oh, here's a contract in an envelope, which I cannot see, but I know that you would like to have a signature on it. So please send me one Bitcoin first. And when, you, when you've done that, I will sign the contract from the outside and send it back to you. So you would send, for example, one Bitcoin to this bank and the bank then provides a signature onto the envelope and sends you back the envelope and still close. It never opened until now. When you receive it back, you can actually open the envelope and take out the contract. And now you have a signature on a contract that says the bank owes me one Bitcoin. And the nice thing about this is that this was a blind signature. So the bank never saw the contract, which means that when you next go, when you take the contract and go now to the bank and say, hey bank, I would like to have my one Bitcoin back, please. And here's the contract with the proof that you approve this, then the bank cannot correlate the signature operation that it did before with the redemption operation that you're doing now. And this is what gives eCash the perfect privacy, basically. So obviously this doesn't happen on paper. It happens with cryptography and you're the only person who can open the envelope because it was encrypted by you and so on and so forth. But these are the details. The general idea is the same. You could build an eCash system purely out of paper as well. So that is the rough idea of how David Chaum envisioned eCash to work already in 82, but obviously not with Bitcoin because it wasn't around, but on the banking system. So replace everything that I said with just dollars. And the idea was phenomenal and very forward thinking and it caused a lot of excitement already in the late 80s and in the beginning of the 90s and big banks like Deutsche Bank and Credit Suisse and big players like MasterCard and Microsoft and they were all very excited about this idea and wanted to build a future in which we can transact online with eCash denominated in US dollars to buy stuff online and so on and so forth. However, unfortunately, this beautiful future that we could have had never came to reality because of several operational problems that the company that was building on this technology called DigiCash made some mistakes here and there. You can research it yourself if you're interested why this business failed, but ultimately there was a business failure of this grandiose idea. However, in hindsight, we can also see that the idea depended on the cooperation with the financial system. So banks must have been on board in order to really build a system that makes sense, right? You need a bank to deposit the US dollar to and then get the e-cash and so on and so forth. So that is also a very big friction point in the development of the story. Well, then e-cash basically died. So this went nowhere except for some experiments that have been done and no significant or meaningful adoption of this technology. And then we waited all together for around another 20 years and Bitcoin came about. So Bitcoin and Satoshi Nakamoto also directly references Charmin e-cash multiple times and everyone was thinking about Charmin e-cash and how to improve that during those 
those times, especially the cypherpunks. Satoshi then found a way to build money that is electronic cash, not quite like eCash that David Chom envisioned, but it solved the problem of needing a centralized server in order to build a monetary system online. So again, just note on that, as I explained before, you need the bank running a server for eCash to work. But with Bitcoin, we don't need anyone specifically to run a server for us. The system is totally decentralized and Bitcoin ultimately won. And now we have basically a base currency for the internet that everyone is free to use however they like. So that was in 2008 when Satoshi invented Bitcoin, which is around 20 years after eCash has died. So the history goes that we waited another 15 years or so until Bitcoin matured and was here to stay and also established itself as the base monetary unit for the internet. And in recent years, we have seen again a new interests pop up in Chaomin eCash, especially from the Bitcoin uh, from the Bitcoin ecosystem. So two projects in the Bitcoin ecosystem right now are Fediment and Cashew, which are both Chaomin eCash implementations, which build on the same idea that I just described, but without the banks. So essentially, we're building custodial systems in a sense that can issue eCash to their users without any cooperation of any bank or so, it by yourself and then offer it as free and open source software. And this allows us to build all kinds of online services that we're already building today, but with much more increased increased privacy and efficiency and other nice things that you can do with eCash. So to make it very short, eCash basically allows us today to build something like Wallet of Satoshi, but with almost perfect privacy so that Wallet of Satoshi doesn't know that you are a user, how much you have in your wallet and with whom you're transacting. I think these are the things that we will be talking about shortly, but essentially, and that's the thing to keep in mind, eCash is a way to build custodial applications with almost perfect privacy. And uh, it should have been part of our lives years ago, but it unfortunately it failed. And now we're trying to fix the problem and see if we can build the system again on top of a free and open source system like Bitcoin, where you can innovate without permission. That was an incredible primer on that. I can tell you may have talked about this before, but I love it. That's It's really important background, I think. And Something that perhaps a lot of maybe more hardcore Bitcoiners really appreciate, but that many, I would say many Bitcoiners and certainly most of the normie population does not appreciate is just how messed up our current system for online payments is. If you think about just even using credit cards online, like every time you go to a website you want to, and you want to check out, you're putting in all of that information. I mean, and not just, not just basically like the private key to your credit card, you know, you're putting in all of that detailed credit card information into an, into a form, but you're also needing to put your billing address, you know, all of that has to match. Like you are, you are doxing yourself and exposing your personal financial information every time you want to make an online payment. That It's really kind of messed up when you think about it, that there isn't another way, like you can't really buy something anonymously online. Until Bitcoin came along, there really wasn't a way to be able to do this. And it's something that I think we've just kind of like accept it as well. This is just normal. This is just how things have to be done because we don't have another solution. And that's what I think is so exciting about all of the eCash work that's coming out now, whether it be Fetty or, you know, Cashew, is that this is an opportunity to do things right, to give people the choice, because that's what it all comes down to. If you want to put in your personal information, you don't care, fine, but you should have the choice. And I think that optionality is so important. Maybe, uh, yeah, um, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, just to comment on that, because I also think that we've basically found ourselves in a trap where we accepted the reality as a given. And, you know, when you look back into the 90s, how it almost succeeded, you can see that after its failure and when it, when eCash was off the table, only then PayPal and credit cards on the internet really pick up. So this was an opportunity to build systems from the beginning that respect our privacy. In order to have a functioning democracy, you need privacy on the lowest level in our society it's very well accepted that we need privacy for communication but especially your activity online when you do small purchases you just you know you purchase maybe an mp3 song or want to read an article online and you pay for the paywall or whatever it is especially the smaller transactions that are not significant in an economic sense leave all sorts of scary metadata about everyone everywhere we have ended up in a system where this is not only the case but also 
wanted because this data is also used to monetize on you after the fact that you have paid and is shared with multiple parties without you really understanding or giving consent to that. So Chomin eCash is an attempt to fix especially smaller payments online and to give users back the privacy where it matters, which is mostly online interactions and on a small scale that we already do every day, every day and everywhere. And I think the other uh, the other important piece there, because you know you mentioned both PayPal but then credit cards. The other very important piece is that both of those are closed systems that you can be cut off from at a moment's notice if you buy the wrong thing, if you say the wrong thing in a completely different silo, and then PayPal decides, you know what, sorry, this goes against our policies and you're no longer able to use our service. Well, now. Now you're screwed. You can't use PayPal. Okay. Your bank cuts you off. You're not allowed to use your credit card. It's really, and I think a lot of Americans, as an American, I'll speak for Americans. A lot of Americans do not realize that it's something that can actually happen to you. They don't realize it because it's never happened to them, but it's something that happens to people all over the world. I was talking with KG last week, who is building uh, Machankura. And one of the reasons he started building that was because his bank shut down and froze his account because he was trying to buy rights to the Bitcoin standard online. And they just froze his account without warning. He couldn't get it back. That's something that sounds you know crazy to a lot of Americans, but uh, you know, it's just a matter of time before these things happen to you. So it's nice to have options and people don't realize you know, if you're cut off from the financial system, you are cut off from everything. You know, how are you supposed to exercise your right to free speech if you can't buy a plane ticket to go to a protest? How are you supposed to exercise your right, you know, again, to free speech online if you've been completely, you know, shut off from being able to pay for a subscription, whatever it might be. It's it's a really important thing both to have that privacy, but then to have at least the censorship resistant capability so that you know you can continue to exercise all your other rights because money is really being able to transact is the base layer of so many other exercises of rights. And I think that goes over a lot of people's heads. They look at them as separate things, but they're very much conjoined. Yes, absolutely. And this is also, I think it's always useful to think back of physical cash and what what beautiful and simple privacy preserving technology there is and how well this is also accepted in our societies. And obviously physical cash is being used less and less everywhere around the world because people prefer the convenience of paying with digital systems. And I understand that because it's more convenient to do it. Um, becomes more and more popular. And with eCash, you can achieve a very similar privacy level as with digital physical cash by building something very similar to, to that in the online space. So I think there is this nice saying that it says, you know, if physical cash was invented today, it would probably be illegal. And that just gives you this perspective of how fast things can change in terms of what is accepted in society and whatnot. And especially what is deemed okay in society today can change very, very quickly in the future. And as as free people of democratic nations, of people who support freedom, we should also support privacy because without privacy, we will not be able to exercise any of our rights in the future. So the conversation should go into a direction where we normalize privacy and enable it for everyone because that's, that's a train we clearly missed when we started building out the internet infrastructure we have today. But I also am very optimistic about this because in recent years we have seen developments that were not, you know, that were unthinkable a couple of years ago with end-to-end -end encryption and Noster as decentralized social media, for example. Bitcoin obviously as unstoppable money that it cannot be taken away from you. And eCash is also part of that because it allows you to build systems, custodial systems that are private, respect your privacy as an individual, and also cannot be censored arbitrarily.